Hi everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. The president is continuing his travel to promote his most recent legislative success, the newly signed bipartisan infrastructure law. Today, he visited another battleground state, Michigan, stopping to speak at a General Motors factory. He test drove GM's new electric Hummer, telling reporters, quote, the sucker is something else. We'll take you there live when he speaks again. But Democrats are still working to pass the other prong of the president's agenda before Congress leaves Washington. The social and climate spending plan the White House calls the Build Back Better bill. As U.S. prices rise, Democratic Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema's support may be wavering. This morning, Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey called on the White House to use their power to lower fuel prices. I am dreaming of a green Christmas. I am dreaming of the American people and the rest of the world knowing that the United States has stepped up. What are we confronted with right now? We can see dramatically rising oil prices all across this country. We should be releasing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to send a message to the oil industry. The House voted Wednesday afternoon largely along party lines to censure Arizona Republican Congressman Paul Gosar. He tweeted a doctored anime cartoon showing a character with Gosar's face superimposed killing another character, which had the face of Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Here's what the Congresswoman said about that threatening cartoon. As leaders in this country, when we incite violence with depictions against our colleagues, that trickles down into violence in this country. And that is where we must draw the line independent of party identity or belief. As punishment, Gosar will be removed from his two House committees. This was House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy's response. Instead, I believe this Congress will go down in history as the broken Congress. For nearly four years, as the House Republicans have been voicing the needs of millions of Americans, House Democrats have broken nearly every rule and standard in order to silence dissident and stack the deck for their radical, unpopular agenda. I want to bring in Natalie Brand and Rhonda Colvin. Natalie covers Congress and the White House for CBS News. And Rhonda is a Capitol Hill reporter for The Washington Post. Welcome to you both. Rhonda, let me start with you. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer said that debate on the Biden social and climate spending plan will start tomorrow. How is this expected to go in the House and will it face a more uncertain fate in the Senate? Well, in the House, you're right. Uh, Steny Hoyer did say that uh, he wants to start some of the procedural voting uh, items uh, starting now through tomorrow, and then hopefully a vote on this spending package on Friday. He did concede to reporters yesterday that it could slip into the weekend. He's told members he wants them to be able to get out of town for their Thanksgiving break next week, but they need to get this done before uh, they let out for that break. So it is expected uh, that this will pass the House. Moderate Democrats have expressed that they would like to wait to vote until Friday after the Congressional Budget Office releases their analysis of how much uh, the spending package is going to cost and if it matches what President Biden has been saying it will cost. Uh, so that's one part of uh, what's going on behind the scenes, but it is expected to be voted on at some point in the next few days. Now, over in the Senate, uh, we heard from Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, uh, this week say that he would like to vote on this on the Senate floor before Christmas or the end of the year. And of course, in congressional time, that, that's no time in congressional time with all of the negotiations and, and things they'll have to do procedurally to get that to a vote. But he did say that he wants to do it before uh, the Christmas and winter holidays. Uh, what we know now uh, is that, uh, once again, Senator Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona are going to be key players in this because this bill, the spending bill, is a reconciliation bill, which is something that is filibuster proof, but it needs that simple majority. It needs all 50 Democrats. So uh, if uh, Senator Manchin is wavering or, or Kirsten Sinema is wavering or any Democrat really is wavering, then that could put this in jeopardy. Um, we're not sure right now exactly where those two senators stand 
on the pace of this vote. We did hear from uh, Manchin uh, a few weeks ago saying that he thought it needed some time, that there shouldn't be a rush. Uh, but he has since said that uh, when it comes up for a vote, it'll come up for a vote. So uh, we're, we're not sure where those two senators, those key senators are right now. Um, but one important wrinkle uh, that may present itself is that uh, the House Democrats did add paid leave back into uh, the spending bill. And that's something that previously Senator Manchin has said he's not going to support. So uh, there will be uh, probably tense days and uh, weeks ahead in the Senate uh, if they are intending to get this out before Christmas. And Rhonda, remind us, I mean, that particular element that you just mentioned, pretty popular, at least when it came to the polling, um, right, that, that issue of paid family leave. That's right. And originally, the, the Biden plan uh, asked for about 12 weeks of uh, paid leave. And now uh, the House Democrats have brought that down to four weeks. Um, but it still stands uh, up against uh, Joe Manchin, who has said that he does not exactly support that being in this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that seems to poll pretty favorably among people, uh, women in the House specifically and in the Senate were the ones who pushed to get it back in there. All right, we'll see what happens on that front. Meantime, Natalie, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has been a prolific fundraiser in spite of being censured herself. Could Congressman Gosar potentially leverage something similarly to his benefit? Well, we'll have to see. You are right. Gosar becomes the second House Republican to be removed from his committee assignments. But this was actually the first vote on a censure resolution in more than a decade. So let's take you back to what happened a short time ago on the House floor. Uh, two Republicans voted with Democrats to move forward with censuring uh, Congressman Gosar of Arizona and removing him uh, from the Oversight Committee and Natural Resources Committee, significant, of course, uh, because that's where uh, lawmakers have the ability to really craft legislation and impact policy at the committee level. Uh, the two Republicans, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, they indicated that they would vote that way. Also notable uh, that another Republican, Dave Joyce, voted present, and three others did not participate in that vote. Uh, that unfolded again a short time ago after, uh, at times, an incredibly emotional and intense debate on the House floor over this resolution earlier. Uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi called this an emergency situation in talking about threats of violence against women and workplace harassment. Uh, leader Steny Hoyer said that he's not seen a situation like this in his 40 plus years in Congress. And a number of other Democratic members who took to the floor talked about the climate here on Capitol Hill post January 6th and the very real uh, threats that, that members have faced in the wake of January 6th. And a number of them noting that these verbal threats or online threats of violence uh, they worry could actual, could turn into actual violence. Now, Republicans, on the other hand, uh, argue uh, during this debate that the process was rushed. It should have gone through the House Ethics Committee. Uh, they wanted to see the process play out there. And they also talked about uh, if the House flips, then this sets a new standard, a new precedent for what the majority could do, especially when it comes uh, to those committee assignments and key committee roles, Elaine. That was going to be my question, Natalie. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with the midterm elections. But if Democrats lose control of the House, what is it that we could see a Republican-led Congress do to retaliate politically? Yeah. Uh, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy definitely signaled that this sets a new standard. Uh, he also said that, quote, the actions in the past have forever changed how the House operates, he said, saying minority rights is, quote, a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, kind of a, a warning to the other side about what could happen uh, in terms of these types of censure resolutions or committee assignment uh, votes that could happen uh, if, in fact, Republicans take the House uh, following the 2022 midterms, which we know historically 
the, the party in power in the White House uh, typically loses congressional seats. Right now, we already have very tight margins, so everyone is on edge ahead of 2022, uh, and this kind of goes to the increasing uh, political atmosphere and also increasing partisan nature that we are currently living in. Well, Rhonda, some Republicans are pushing to remove members of their caucus who voted for Joe Biden's infrastructure deal. Who's leading that charge? And is there any sense of how this might wind up? Yeah, we've heard that from uh, some of the uh, GOP caucus members in the House uh, who are on the, the further right side, uh, who have said that they think those 13 members of uh, the House GOP who voted for uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan should be removed from committees um, and that they should also see, see very tough reelection campaigns as well. Um, right now, it's a lot of talk. Uh, you, we have heard that some of these members, some of the 13, have said that they have even received death threats uh, from people uh, who have uh, learned that they voted for President Biden's plan and uh, aren't agreeing with that. One in particular is uh, uh, Representative Upton of Michigan. He voted mm -hmm. for it and said that he received a, a call from someone who's not even in his state or constituent of him, uh, and it was a death threat. So uh, this sort of rhetoric that uh, members of the House GOP have been um, saying and inflaming uh, certainly seems to be having some consequences. But will it lead into anything substantive like uh, committee removal? Uh, I'm not hearing anything very specific about that. Uh, but it is something that's being talked about. And it is sort of funny because it's unique to the House. Mm -hmm. Over on the Senate side, there were 19 Republicans who voted for President Biden's infrastructure plan, and many of them have really been uh, celebrating that vote. Uh, I, I know in my email this week, since that bill has been signed, I've received Senate uh, Republican emails saying that they this bill is going to do so many great things in mm. their states. So this seems to be a very uh, unique situation over with the House GOP. So help us understand that, Rhonda. Why would that be that on the one hand you have people, um, in fact, we saw like Senator Rob Portman, right, Republican of Ohio, actually there at the signing of that infrastructure bill, standing there with Democrats and uh, celebrating the signing of that legislation, where on the House side, as you point out, you know, people like Congressman Fred Upton have received threats to his life as a result of signing on to a piece of legislation. I think one of the reasons it's unique to the House is it's sort of um, indicative and illustrates some of the uh, inner turmoil that's going on really with both parties in the House, because, of course, there there have been uh, you know, many reported disagreements among House Democrats as well and, and the progressive arm within House Democrats. Uh, but with House uh, GOP members, it, it seems to be something that uh, they, they want to pick up as a cause so that uh, it may help them come midterm time to say that they stood together uh, against anything that Biden did or his agenda. So it, it appears to be a lot of politics, not uh, as much substance uh, when it comes to actually removing uh, Republicans from their committees. But it does seem to, to do some sort of damage because you are hearing about uh, these death threats and some of these calls that these 13 Republicans have received. All right, switching gears, Natalie, Steve Bannon has filed a motion to plead not guilty to contempt of Congress charges. So what comes next? Yeah, Elaine, this comes ahead of his scheduled court appearance before the district judge that will be overseeing the case and a potential trial. He sent a notice to the court uh, entering that plea of not guilty against the charges of contempt of Congress uh, related, of course, to not complying with the January 6th committee investigating the Capitol attack. Uh, and he also noted that he uh, is willing to waive his arraignment, saying that he does not need the charges to be read out loud uh, formally. So what this could mean, perhaps, is if he does appear in court tomorrow, it could be uh, a check-in and setting of, of next steps. But you may remember back to Monday, uh, Steve Bannon appeared quite defiant in front of cameras, uh, mm -hmm. both while turning himself in and then after uh, his, his first court appearance that day, uh, when he said, 
that he and his legal team were going to go on the offense saying, quote, they took on uh, the wrong guy and really promising uh, an intense legal fight here. And then uh, the other question that remains here on Capitol Hill uh, is what does that a formal charge by the Department of Justice mean for uh, other individuals who have not complied with uh, committee uh, requests and subpoenas. We're still waiting to see whether or not the committee takes action against Mark Meadows, President, former President Trump's uh, chief of staff, who also defied a subpoena request. Uh, they have not indicated how they're going to go about uh, regarding Mark Meadows, although uh, committee members have said that the contempt charges against Bannon should serve as a clear warning to other individuals that they cannot ignore their requests or stonewall this investigation. Finally, Rhonda, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is launching a new program to engage voters of color. What does that look like and why is it so critical for them ahead of the 2022 midterms? Well, it, looked like the, it looks like the Democratic uh, committee there, Congressional uh, Committee, is uh, looking at ways to sort of amplify some of the tried and true strategies that we saw work in uh, places like Georgia with that tough uh, Senate race back in uh, last January, uh, where there was a lot of grassroots mobilizing. Uh, they seem to want to start to incorporate that in uh, some of their congressional campaign uh, strategies for 2022. Um, they're going to be putting money uh, into local grassroots organizing, also uh, ads targeted to communities of color. They're also going to be putting some money toward uh, voter education. And uh, we all know that uh, many states have been looking at changing their voting laws. Some have been successful in that. So people need to know uh, what those voting laws do and how they, they can vote in their states. So Democrats see this as an opportunity right now to uh, work with people at the ground level and do more uh, of that sort of grassroots mobilizing. Um, and they're also uh, discussing ways to go up against uh, misinformation that they feel targeted a lot of uh, people of color in past elections. So they're going to uh, have that as part of their strategy too, trying to disarm misinformation uh, and miseducation about voting. Um, one of the important things that export, experts and observers say is that uh, they should keep in mind with all of this focus and targeting toward people of color for 2022, they need to keep in mind that uh, voters of color are a monolith and mm -hmm. you can't have sort of a, a sweeping strategy across the country that would uh, work to attract uh, Democrats of color or voters of color and mm -hmm. expect them to, to vote in droves uh, when it comes to 2022. Uh, but this is something that uh, the uh, Triple C announced this week and uh, say that this is part of their strategy that they're also building on uh, from some of the things they've learned in uh, Georgia and other places that seem to work really well uh, in contests before. It'll really be interesting to see how energized or not energized different segments of the electorate are um, heading into 2022. All right, Natalie Brand and Rhonda Colvin, it's good to have you both. Thank you very much.